Hello, and welcome to episode number 23 of CS350 Online. I'm your host, Leslie, and in today's episode, it's going to be a bunch of leftovers. We're going to finish up our section on file systems, and in particular, we've got to talk about fault tolerance. And then we're also going to talk about um, some sample problems with file systems. So I've got two lovely sample problems that we haven't done yet. And after we take up those sample problems, we're going to kind of wrap up all the topics of the course by, if we have time, talking about virtual machines. And then you're probably thinking, oh, that means it's the end of the course, but you've paid for 24 episodes, but in our next episode, we're still going to have an episode 24, we are going to have some fun and talk about something else related to operating systems, just to kind of close everything out nice and neat. So then, let's get started with the OS of the day. So we're really into the modern era of operating systems now. So today I'm going to talk about Android and iOS together. These two operating systems were released roughly around the same time, Apple in 2007 and Android in 2008. And they are both Unix-like operating systems. Now, Android itself predates uh, its release in 2008. Uh, it actually was started in 2003 and it was a company that was acquired by Google. It is a fork of the Linux kernel. So this is taking advantage of a lot of um, open, free and open source software, so that's very nice. But they've made a few modifications to it because if you're running on a cell phone or a handheld device, you wanna make sure that you're not wasting battery power. So one of the different things that they've done is how they handle process management. Now when we think of process management, as you know from implementing it yourself, you open a process and when you're done with the process, you terminate it. And when you terminate the process, you would traditionally free the address space, free the process structure, and so on and so forth. But here's the thing about a cell phone use. Now, please keep in mind, I don't really, I own a cell phone, so my household has one cell phone, one for all of us. And the only reason why we have just one is we use it for maps and emergencies. We don't do the whole texty thing. Maybe that makes me old. I don't know. I just don't like it. So, but if you think about the, how the average person would use a cell phone, they're opening up things like Messenger. They're opening, I, I don't know, Tumblr? <laughs> I don't even know the names of most of the apps, social media apps people use on cell phones. So there you go. So the point I'm trying to make is you're going to be opening the same apps over and over and over again. So every time one of your friends sends you a message, you're going to open the Messenger app and then you're going to close it again. But if you're opening and closing the same apps over and over and over again, Think about all the work that you would be doing to create that process, run that process, and shut that process down. And that's a lot of extra work for something that you're gonna keep opening again and again. So one of the things that Android does for its process management is instead of actually keeping the process, um, instead of destroying the processes, they keep them in memory. Um, so the idea is that the process has no CPU resources when it's not in use, but it's still there in memory. So it's address space is still there and all of that. And then the idea is the next time somebody tries to open and run it, you don't actually have to go through the process of open, load, creating an address space, loading the address space or, or what have you, because it's already there and in memory. Um, and then of course, when you close it, you don't necessarily have to go through the process of freeing everything either. Now, obviously this isn't perfect because at some point if you're like so i have a six-year-old daughter and if she uses the cell phone she's downloaded like every game under the sun on it sorry every free game under the sun <laughs> and she'll sit there if she sits down if she steals the cell phone and goes up to her room and plays with it she has like 300 different silly games open. So there comes a point where you actually run out of memory or you're going to run out of memory. And so they actually do have to start killing some of these process structures that are sitting there, not using resources, but still there. So <coughs> that's when you start doing things like, well, kill the oldest process or kill the process that hasn't been used frequently. So, <coughs> excuse me. This is what you have to do. Um, it's, it's those cash eviction strategies that you will do again, just now you're going to do it with which process should I delete? So they've made numerous other changes 
to the kernel as well. And some of them include uh, improvements to the synchronization primitives and so on. And Google claims that they are slowly trying to rejoin uh, Android with the mainline Linux kernel, but who knows if and when that will happen. So that's Android. And then iOS, that's Apple's version. Um, it's like Android is a fork of the Linux kernel. So it's fairly easy to work with as a developer. And iOS is a variant of Mac OS X, but it's application incompatible. So what that means is that in Android, it is theoretically possible that applications that you get to work on a, a Linux kernel, you could probably get them to work on Android with a little bit of effort. Whereas with iOS, that's not really going to be feasible. And if you're doing iOS development, you really, really do have to use an emulator to actually develop not on the device. Um, now, what's really interesting is that with iOS, Apple has been very restrictive about the kinds of features that they give to the applications. So for example, if you look back at the iPhone 3GS and everything before it, the concept of multitasking was incredibly limited, almost non-existent. So if you wanted to like download an update and listen to music at the same time, you couldn't do it. If you wanted to read something on the internet and listen to music, you couldn't do it. You could only do one thing at a time. It was incredibly restricted that way. Now, my understanding is that you could, um, um, there was some uh, jailbreaking that you could do in order to get the multitasking to work. But even still, they don't support multitasking quite in the same way that we think about it. So, for example, I don't think you could like let's suppose you made an iOS based ray tracer because I don't know why you would do that but let's suppose you did do that I'm not sure you could have a ray tracer running on iOS at the same time as playing a video game on iOS I'm not sure that the uh the multitasking that they're doing is that kind so if I had to take a guess they're probably still doing some kind of cooperative based multitasking on it um they do allow things to happen now. So background downloads, that's supported. You can play music while surfing the internet and do things like that now. But it, as I said, it's still not, hey, I'm watching two YouTube videos at the same time. So that's kind of fun. But, and I mean, maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, iOS seems so limited in this. But is it? Because I don't know about you, but if I have a cell phone and it's like this big, why am I watching two YouTube videos on it at the same time? That doesn't make sense. I don't even want to watch one YouTube video on that screen because it's so damn small. So I, whether or not you agree with how they've decided to support multitasking on iOS, I kind of understand where they're coming from, looking at how the device is actually used. Because it's such a small device, you're not really going to be using multiple apps at the same time. So, anyways, that's my rant. We have one more lovely uh, OS of the day, and hopefully we will get to that on Thursday. So let's then go and talk about file systems again. And I'm just going to get my button here. I don't want to advance to the next slide yet because I want to let the last operating system be a surprise. And um, let's go and talk about file systems again. So we've been talking about the physical file system. And just to review that, I'm actually going to go back to this love, a couple diagrams here, because it's been, you know, five days and most people forget things after five days. So when you have a very, this very simple file system, this inode-based file system, which is kind of like the older ext1, ext2 style file systems uh, from, from, Unix land. Um, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to subdivide our disk logically into a bunch of blocks. And we set aside some number of the blocks to be data blocks for the files. And remember that we're not going to let the files actually share those data blocks. And as proof of this, we can actually go into my own file system here. And I'm going to go into a coding directory. Oh, which code file do I want to go into? Let's go into, I think I like to use spline draw here. So I've got um, 
some nice images. So I've got this uh, main, oh, that's too big. Uh, let's use this compile.sh. It's a shell script I use to compile my files. And it says here that the file is 85 bytes. But if I actually look at the information for this file, even though it is technically only 85 bytes, you'll notice that the file size on disk is actually four kilobytes. What that's saying to you is that the block size on my disk is four kilobytes and the block is not being shared with another file. So I'm using 85 bytes out of the total four kilobytes. Interesting, eh? It's kind of, kind of an interesting quirk. All right, so we've got these data blocks and then we've got a bunch of blocks at the very beginning of the physical volume that we use to actually determine information about that file system. So just to review them very, very briefly here. Where's that lovely picture? The first block is going to be the super block. And the super block's job is to tell the operating system about this file system. So how many, what's the size of the data blocks? How many data blocks are there? How many inodes are there? Where's the start of the inode array? Where's the inode bitmap? Where's the data block bitmap? All of that information about the file system is contained in the super block so that when you plug it in and the file system is mounted by the operating system it actually knows how to interact with that physical disk hmm. then we have the inode and data block bitmap and the purpose of these is to actually keep track of which blocks and which inodes on your disk are actually free. And that's so we can avoid actually having to read in everything and compute whether it's free or not. So we're going to use one bit for each inode and one bit for each data block. And if the bit is one, it's in use. And if the bit is zero, it's free. And we can, this is advantageous to use this method because in one block, I can support 32,000 inodes or 32,000 data blocks. Um, which is going to mean that when I need to find a free one, I have to load into memory significantly less data in order to get the answer. And then we have the inode array. Now remember the inodes are a fixed size data structure that's going to contain all of the lovely metadata for our files. Our particular inodes are 256 bytes in size, which means that we can fit 80 of them in our inode array. And in order to have a file, you actually have to have an inode for that file. Now inside the inode, we know that there are things like the file type, the permissions, the length, the number of blocks and all that things, things about um, last access time, last write time, last read time and so on. And then there are things like direct all these different kinds of data pointers. Now to review the data pointers, you've got direct pointers, which are going to point it directly to data blocks. And those are going to point to the lowest bytes of the file. You'll have to use a single indirect, which is a pointer to a block of pointers to data blocks, if you can't fit your file amongst the directs. If you can't fit your file with the single indirect pointers, then you'll have to use a double indirect, which is a pointer to a block of pointers to a block of pointers to file data. And if that's still not enough, then you'll take advantage of the triple indirect, which is a pointer to a block of pointers to a block of pointers to a block of pointers to file data. And what's really interesting is that this 256 byte inode is actually able to track a file that's over four terabytes in size. So that's pretty cool. Now, one of the interesting things about an inode based file system is that if you want to access the last byte of the file, it's actually really easy because you can very quickly compute which pointer path you need to take. And then it's going to take a fixed number. So if you have to go through the triple, then you're going to have to read the inode and then one, two, three pointer blocks, and then finally the data blocks. So that's five total reads, assuming you own the I number to get the last byte of a four terabyte file. But there are so, so random IO on this kind of um, file is actually quite efficient. But one of the things that's not terribly efficient about this style of file system or is the extra pointers that are actually being stored to keep track of the file. So with the single indirect, you've only got one pointer block. The double indirect, you're actually going to have, so if, you, if each of these pointer blocks contains n pointers, then you're gonna have n plus one blocks. And then for the triple indirect, you're going to have n squared plus one blocks. That's a lot of extra pointer blocks a lot of them. 
So all of these are pointer blocks are not are taking up data blocks in your file system. So that means that the amount of d extra data that your file is actually consuming on the disk actually is quite a bit. And then we looked at, as just a small comparison, we looked at chaining. Now, chaining was really, really, that's where you essentially store the data blocks as a linked list where each one has a pointer to the next one. Now, the advantage, the disadvantage here, sorry, is that your file is a linked list. And if I want to access the last byte, I actually have to follow the whole chain to find it. And that's true whether you use chaining or external chaining where the chain is stored elsewhere. You still actually have to visit every no whether it's visit everything in the external chain or visit every actual data block, you still have to check a lot of things in order to get to the last byte because it's a linked list. So random access on chaining is not very good, but sequential access is actually okay, which is why you see a lot of file systems for media players actually still using chaining is because we don't tend to do random access on files, on movie files. We tend to read them in order. Um, now, the advantage, however, of a chained file system is the fact that you don't have all of this extra data being stored to keep track of where all the data blocks are. So all of these extra pointer blocks that we saw here, they don't exist in chaining. Because all we have in chaining is just a, for each block will have one pointer to the next block, and that's it. So this one actually takes a lot less space on disk. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. All right, so let's talk a bit about file system design. So let's suppose you wanted to go out and you wanted to design yourself a file system. I mean, maybe you do want to do that. Maybe you don't. If you want to design a file system, you have to ask, ask yourself, what kinds of files are you going to store in your file system? If we actually look at our general purpose use case file system, and you were to look at your own file, most files are really small on your computer like less than two kilobytes. Although the average file size is growing because as you know, picture sizes grow, uh, device drivers grow, everything is growing. It's always growing because we have space, so let it grow, right? We add features, let it grow. So most files are going to still though be very, very small. And you're going to have on average hundreds of thousands of files on this file system. So this is like the disk in front of you. Um, you will have directories, but those directories don't typically contain a lot of things. And most file systems, we see a utilization of about 50% of the total disk space. So that's the general purpose file system where most things like NTFS and Riser and EXT3 and all of those things, that's what they were designed for. But that's not every use case. A lot of file system, a lot of situations out there call for different. So for example, let's suppose you wanted to create a file system for a database uh, system. And um, you know that every single file or every single record that's going to be stored as a file is one kilobyte or less. How would you change the file system then based on that information? So you know there's going to be billions of files, billions and billions and billions of files. But they're all going to be really, really small. Well, what you would do is you would, because there are so many files, you're going to make sure that your inode array is really, really big because you're going to have billions of files. But you might change the size of the data block. So instead of having data blocks be, say, four kilobytes, knowing that each file is going to be at most one kilobyte, but wanting to prepare for the future, you might make the file block size be two kilobytes. But you have to consider the consequences of that because if you do that, then at the moment that you design this file system, 50% of the disk won't be usable. Something to consider. So maybe we do make the file data block size one kilobyte. It's a discussion. If you have to think about what makes sense now and what will make sense in the future 10 years from now. 
So you have to decide the number of inodes, the size of the blocks, how big should they be? How many direct and indirect pointers should the inode have? And in the case of our little example here, I would probably give each inode, if I was using say one kilobyte data blocks, or maybe I won't use one kilobyte, maybe I'll use 512 byte data blocks. And then maybe I will give each inode um, eight, eight pointers. Because if I give it eight direct pointers, then I can actually support file sizes up to four kilobytes. And since my block size is now smaller than the maximum file size, I won't be wasting so much space. But you see what I mean? You have to think about what is the best way for me to set the block size such that I'm not wasting 50% of my disk space or more. How do I choose how many direct pointers to put into the inodes so that the system can grow in the future? Now, on the other hand, so that was really small files. What if you wanted to do really big files? So for example, uh, I work with film and one of the things that we see a lot of is film archives. So all of the things that you make produce, all of the content actually gets saved. And that makes sense, of course. I mean, how do you think they release uh, the Avengers Endgame movie, you know, six months later with seven minutes more footage? Well, where did you think that footage came from? Did you think they went back into the studios and filmed seven more minutes? Of course not. It's too expensive. They recorded all that footage originally, and then they decided to add it back in. So actually, so side story. I, I'm going to start watching Lord of the Rings, I think extended, extended edition today. So what's that, like six hours of extra footage? <laughs> I think my kids will like it. Anyways. So if you're storing film content, here's the thing. Database files are really small and there's billions of them that are gonna be accessed really often. But if you're trying to make an archive for film content, the files are really huge there's not going to be many of them comparatively, and they're not going to be accessed very frequently. So if I was doing something like a file system designed for a film archive, I would actually probably use a chained based file system. I don't necessarily, and the reason for that is because it's film content. I'm not going to be randomly accessing the middle of the, the file. I'm going to be copying archived content from their file system to my local file system to be worked on. So chaining is probably okay for that. If I had to design some kind of inode based system, I wouldn't need so many inodes because I have so many file. I don't have so many files. So you can see here, it's very interesting how we design this. I would also, by the way, for something like a, an archive system for large files, I might also use a much larger block size, like one meg or something. So when it comes down to designing a file system, you have to ask yourself, how is this being used? Eh, it's kind of a fun thought experiment. Okay. The last part of our file system slides before we get into some lovely sample problems is to talk about uh, what happens when you have a failure. So supposing you live at something like Icon Towers, I always pick on Icon because I always hear about power outages at Icon. And let's suppose that you were deleting a file and the power goes out mid delete. What happens? Well, on our inode based file system, this is what could happen. As you know, delete doesn't actually erase the data of the file. What we do do, however, is we're going to mark the inode as free in the inode bitmap, and we're going to mark the data blocks as being free in the data block bitmap. But what happens if the way your delete was implemented is the inode has been marked as free before the data blocks were marked as free and the power goes out? before you were able to mark the data blocks as free. Well, then what you end up happening is the inode is free so it can be reused, but all of those data blocks, because they are no longer referenced by an active inode, they're stuck in use, never to be used again. So you can actually cause some problems with the actual file system structures 
if the power goes out or there's a disk fault at the wrong point in time. Whenever we are modifying the metadata that for our file system, we can get serious problems. And what we really want is what's known as crash consistency. So I want to make sure if there's a crash that it doesn't hurt the metadata of my file system. Now on how can you recover from these failures? So when I was growing up there, we didn't use journaled file systems, not to say that they're perfect, but we used things like ext2 and we used things like FAT32 and FAT16. And when the system crashed and you started your computer back up again, uh, at least for Windows, it would come back up and it would immediately run scan disk. And what scan disk does, or fseek in, um, in a Unix system, what it does is it's going to look at the metadata. It's going to check, is every data block that's marked as in use actually referred to by some inode? It's not a fast process to do this check. But we do this check, and if we find some data blocks that aren't referred to by any inode or any of the pointer blocks, then we know that those data blocks were probably freed and we just got corrupted. And so you could actually perform some corrections. So that's kind of an interesting thing that we can do. It's not perfect, however, because while we can find things like files that have no directory entries and we can find free space that's not marked as free there are other faults that we can't recover from and so periodically with these older file systems you would actually have it would come to a point where it just stopped working properly and you'd have to format and start again so we wanted to make systems more crash consistent, and that's where journal file systems come into play. And this isn't a new concept, but certainly this is what NTFS and EXT3, EXT4, and Riser, and all of them are actually using these days. The idea behind a journal file system is we're going to log the metadata changes we want to make before we make them. So what we're going to do is we have a special set-aside memory that we are going to actually record all the changes we want to make to metadata. So if I want to mark an inode as free, I'm going to mark write that in the journal. If I want to write some data blocks are free, I'm going to write that in the journal. I'm not going to perform the action right away. I write it to my journal and then periodically, after the changes have been journaled, then I perform the update to the actual disks data structures. They call this write ahead logging. So you're going to log, and then after you've recorded what you intend to do, then you actually do it. The idea is that after you've completed the actual change to the structure, you can clear the journal out or clear that entry from the journal. And if there is a failure at any point, you can look and see, well, since you don't clear the journal until the task has been completed, when you power back on, we can look at the journal and we can see what operations either haven't been completed or haven't happened yet, and we can just re-execute the journal itself. So that's kind of fun. Is that perfect? No. Uh, you can still corrupt a journaled file system, but it's a lot harder to do and it takes a lot more time to get it into a state where you actually have to like format and redo it from scratch again. Now, I have had to do this with NTFS. Um, I think, so when I had NTFS based RAID arrays, I had problems with that, but my current NASs are all running ext4 and I have had no problems. None at all. So, but they're not all creeped equally. All right, so that's officially the end of the file system slides. And what I'd like to do now is actually do some sample problems. So for those of you following along, the first one I would like to look at is called PathTrans. And uh, PathTrans, of course, I go to use my tablet and it says connection lost. So let's suppose you want to write the function to actually translate a path into an I number. So I want to actually write 
the little bit of code that's going to take a path and produce for me an i number. And we've got some functions that we can use to help us with help us with the task already. We've got is directory to check whether an i number is a directory, number of components, that's going to tell us how many components in the path name. We can get a particular component of the path name and d search, which is going to be uh, searching a directory for a file name and it's going to return the i number if it's there. So let's actually write this little bit of code here. So let's bring up OneNote. Let's hope OneNote wants to cooperate. Let's get some lines. There we go. All right. So let's let's do this. So first we've got, of course, our function name. Oh, that's fun. No, it's not trying at all. Uh. For next term, I think I am seriously going to be looking into a OneNote alternative because this is just ridiculous. All right, so we've got our function, we'll call it int translate. The thing that you don't know is my fan on this machine is absolutely going nuts. And um, I don't know if you know much about how the, the more recent generations of Macs actually handle overheating. They actually start to throttle the CPU down. So if I start getting really blocky here, that's what's going on. So I have this translate function and it's going to take a string and I'm going to be really lazy and just call it path. Remember this is just pseudocode. Now there's more than one way to write this function, but let's start, we've got int inum equals zero. Now we're going to make the assumption that zero is the i number of the root. All right. And then I'm going to have some other int i, which is going to be for indexing my path components. So I am then in a loop going to do for i is equal to from 1 to the number of components in my path. Please excuse the fact that I'm probably using MATLAB code for this. Now, why have I looked at the first component of the, f the um, path and not the zeroth component? I know the zeroth component's the root. And so I'm going to be looking for the next component in the current component. So we're going to start indexing at one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the previous thing or the current thing is actually a directory because I can't look at the next component unless this one is a directory. So we're going to say if, again, short forming the text here, if inum is not a directory, I'm going to return invalid. because I can't look up the i number for this part of the path if the thing position I'm currently at is not a directory. We can only look up i numbers in directory. So if i num doesn't correspond to a directory, then I can't look up the path because it's not valid. If it is a directory, then I'm going to set i number is equal to the i number I get from calling dsearch on my current directory and the component of the path corresponding to i. All right, not too bad so far, right? 
then what we're going to do is we need to make sure that this actually produced an i number. So we're going to check if i num is less than zero, return invalid. If the i number returned from the directory search is less than zero, well, there's no negative i numbers, which means this is not a valid, that doesn't exist in that directory, and therefore this is not a valid path. So we'll return invalid. If, however, we reach the end of this, then we have the i number for our file, so we turn i num. There we go. There is some very quick and dirty pseudocode to take a path and actually produce the i number for that file or an error if it exists. It's pretty fun, right? Okay. And now then, since there are no questions on Twitch, now it is time for my favorite problem of all. This is so much my favorite problem. I absolutely love this one. So for those of you following along at home, this is fileio.pdf. And it is in the uh, zip file of all of the um, handouts. So we have here a little program that is making use of the logical file system. We have a very big file on disk. We're going to assume it's like four terabytes in size, OK? because it makes the problem fun. And the file is already open. And so we we know it's we we have its i number. But nothing is in the cache. The i node is in the cache and there's no data blocks in the cache. And I'm going to perform the following operations. I'm going to seek to byte 10,500. Then I am going to write 1,000 bytes to the file. And then I am going to read 1,000 bytes from the file. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the question then asks, if the file system has block size of 1 kilobyte, and the inodes have 9 direct pointers, 1 indirect pointer, and 1 double indirect pointer, and the block cache and inode cache are initially empty, how many reads and write operations will the operating system need to do to perform the seek, the write, and the read? Now, you know what? I think I'd like to give you an opportunity to try this problem at home. This is my favorite problem. And the reason why it's my favorite problem is because you have to be able to break the file system down and then it's going the, the actual physical file system to figure out where all the bytes actually live, like how many bytes are addressable by direct, how many bytes are addressable by single. And then you have to remember what kinds of operations to the file system each of these different IO ops would actually do. So you know what? I'll introduce the problem right now, as I've just done, and in our next episode, we'll take this one up. That'll leave you a little cliffhanger for Thursday. All right. So then. Now that we've got that problem introduced, I'd like to start talking about something else. As I said, this is a bit of a leftovers episode. <clears throat> so our coverage of operating systems in this course is done at a pretty high level. We introduce you to a lot of the core concepts, things like threads and synchronization, how you might implement concurrency using things like yield and block or using things like preemption. We introduce you to the concepts of processes and system calls and how do we abstract the kernel from the user land. Virtual memory, we go into great fairly, it seems like fairly great detail, but we're actually still covering the very high level theories of what we are doing. The same with scheduling and devices and file systems. 
So this is a pretty high level coverage of the topic of operating systems. If you were to actually do some research into operating systems, the field, you'll notice that when we come to talking about virtual memory like segmentation, there's a lot more implementation details to segmentation than what we have covered. But now that you have this high level understanding, you should be able to go out and actually get a better, deeper understanding of how actual methods are being implemented. But I want to kind of close out all of the new topics with talking about something a little bit more current, and that's the concept of virtual machines. Now, virtual machines, they've been around for a fairly long time. The concept isn't actually new. Uh, the concept of a virtual machine, which by the way means a simulated or emulated computer, that actually goes back to about the 1960s. But the reason why you don't really see virtual machines being used until probably the last 10 or 15 years is because that the performance is really bad. So think about it this way. You have a computer that's your actual base computer, your host computer. On top of it, you are going to run a simulated computer. And on top of that, a program on the simulated program computer. So it's like your code has to run here, but here is really just pushing it down below. That's going to be a pretty big performance hit. And it wasn't until 2005 where VMs start to come back and they are able to come back in 2005 um, because CPU started offering hardware support to make things go at a reasonable pace. And nowadays, most of us do use some form of virtualization. I know a lot of students are using Docker for this course. Um, I don't use Docker, <laughs> never used it. Um, so if I don't throw my pen uh, and other people choose to use things like VirtualBox or VMware, there's lots of different ways that you can do virtual machines. You have actually, if you haven't used any of those, you're like, I've never used a VM before. Well, you have actually, if you did your assignments. Because after all, what is Sys161? It's an emulated computer. It's an emulated MIPS R3000. And we are running OS161 on that emulated hardware. So that Sys161 is in a way a virtual machine, a very simple one, but it's still a fake computer. So what virtual machines give us the ability to do is to give, make one machine act as many. So for example, if I run VMware, and I've run VMware before, I, when I ran VMware in Windows, I would often have VM for Linux. So I could do all of my code in a Linux environment while still operating from the basis of Microsoft. Now, why wasn't I just running Linux natively at that time? I don't remember the details, but there was an actual logical reasons for me to do this. Uh, oh yes, I remember. It's because I got tired of having to reboot my computer to go into Linux land when I needed to write code because one of the jobs I was working on was a Windows only development job. Okay. But it's not just making a computer act as many computers. I mean, that was an example of, you know, being able to run Linux inside of Windows, which is pretty useful. But from the perspective of Amazon, let's think about that. If any of you have ever used Amazon's um, AWS services, if you haven't, you should look into them. If you ever need to do any kind of big computations, they've got tiers there that can actually be used. You can rent time on somebody else's computer. It's, it's great. But Amazon doesn't have, so if you go on Amazon's AWS, let's actually do that here. Let me open a, a new, um, What did it just do? Sometimes I don't know what Apple does. Um, so if I actually open up Chrome here, and uh, let's say I want to go to aws.amazon.com. 
So you can actually look at the different products that they have. So I want to go to compute. So I want to go to EC2, which is their uh, Elastic Compute Cloud. And um, if I go to the Elastic Compute Cloud, I can go to like instance types, instant type explorer. So these are all the different kinds of computers that you can rent from Amazon. Actually, I want to make this full screen so you can actually see this. So let's do that. And then let's grab, there we go, Amazon there. So you can see we've got some Mac instances and uh, we've got some processors here. We've got this M6 uh, G instance, which instead of having a um, i7, they have AWS Graviton 2 processor. Uh, we've got T3 instances, we've, which has scalable processors, M5 instances, which are Xeons, some of these instances are actual different physical hardware, but not all of them. You can see there's like five pages of different ones. So let's look at the, the processors, the accelerators, so um, graphics accelerators. Uh, there's so many different kinds of computers. Do you honestly think Amazon actually has like 300 different kinds of physical computers in their data centers? That doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because if they did that, then the maintenance would be a nightmare. The truth of the story is a lot of these instances are actually virtual. They call them instances because a lot of them are virtual. You are creating a virtual machine. And a lot of these instances, you are getting access to virtual CPUs. So let's look at general purpose here. So for example, if we just go down to this T3 instance, you'll see here that it says eight V CPUs as in virtual CPUs. So virtualization is a really powerful thing where you can have one computer act as a different computer, or you could have one computer simultaneously act as many different kinds of computers to make maintenance easier and many, many other things. We'll talk more about AWS here in a minute. Where's my, there it is. All right. So here's some things about virtualization. When we have a virtual machine and we're running an operating system on a virtual machine, there are some basic rules that we want. We want to make sure that the operating system and the programs running in the operating system on that virtual hardware, they should behave completely normally. That is the operating system, the guest shouldn't even be aware that the hardware they are running on isn't real. And when you are actually, when you choose an instance on Amazon, and let's say you choose like a Mint instance running on some virtual CPUs, you shouldn't be aware that that's not an actual physical computer that you have ownership of for the next three weeks. The operating system shouldn't be aware that it's running on top of something else shouldn't know that. It should be completely isolated. At least that's the goal or that's the ideal. Now, we haven't exactly implemented that perfectly in all cases. So how do you, how do you do this? So just some things to review the whole course now of who does what. So your system has a bunch of hardware, right? You've got CPU, RAM, and a whole bunch of devices. Your CPU is going to execute some instructions um, that correspond to the actual operating system and the user's program. And when there's a problem, it throws an exception because it doesn't know what to do. The operating system does pretty much everything else. It's going to create the execution environment for the program. It manages the memory, it implements concurrency, and it handles all interrupts and exceptions raised by the CPU. So things like divisions by zero, TLB misses on store, i.e. I tried to write to an address that is, I'm not allowed to, 
All of those things are handled by the operating systems. The operating system and the hardware are fairly tightly integrated. So let's actually try our first attempt at making a virtual machine. I Let's try to do Sys161. So what we're going to do is we are going to compile OS161 to the MIPS R3000 language. Okay, that's what we'll do. And then we're going to have some computer, some virtual machine we're going to use to run our program compiled to R3000 code. So what does this program do? What does this VM do? Well, what it does is because the CPU doesn't exist. I don't have an R3000 here. I have an i9. I don't actually know if I have any R3000s in my house. I don't have a PS2 anymore, so yeah, I don't think I have an R3000. <laughs> All right. So what this little program is doing is it is capturing every instruction and it's translating the instructions from R3000 into instructions for the host machine. So I am in Sys161 effectively translating all of the R3000 instructions to x86 instructions. I mean, that's the idea. And then the idea is that the virtual machine 6161 after it performs the translation, that instruction will actually be executed by the host operating system on the physical CPU. But then you get into some really complicated details. For example, in OS 161, when we have a spin lock, we disable interrupts. So, and I'm allowed to do it because OS 161 is an operating system and it's supposed to execute with kernel privilege. So on my virtual machine here, is it supposed to like have that disable interrupts on my host operating system? That seems like a really bad idea. How do we handle privilege? How do we handle virtual memory? So this is a very simplistic attempt at trying to create a virtual machine. I hope as you can see here, it's actually a lot more complicated. So as I said, things like Spinlock Acquire are going to be very complicated because we want to be able to just have the VM translate everything. But I can't let a user program, and OS161 and Sys161, Sys161 are both user programs, I can't let them take a privileged instruction like disable interrupts and have the VM translate that to disable interrupts and have that run on my host CPU and have that work. That can't happen because that would mean a user program is doing a privileged operation on the actual host computer. So that's a big in problem. Then we also run into problems like with devices where if I push a key on my keyboard and I have OS 161 running and Mac OS running, to which operating system does the letter K go to? Who handles the interrupt for pushing the letter K? And then we end up with problems of virtual memory. So it's entirely possible that both operating systems are using paging. What happens if we have a collision between the two page tables? and the page table for the virtual machine ends up overwriting uh, the page table in host OS or something silly like that. There are some real complicated issues we have to deal with here. So the comment on Twitch is that it seems like it is more like converting the host OS into Sys161 instead of running it on top of it. I mean, yeah, we say running on top of but really what we are doing because that's how it appears to the user. But really what's happening is we're just finding a way to translate one program to running on the, the host system in that environment. So a word we need to talk about is the word hypervisor. 
So this is something that manages all of the virtual machines. It creates the virtual machines, it destroys the virtual machines, and it manages the virtual machines. And there's two types of these. And you probably all have a lot of experience with type two. So we'll start with type two. Type two hypervisors run on your host operating system. So this is the diagram here. You have your physical CPU and your host operating system. So if you're running macOS, this will be macOS. And then if you were running VMware, well, VMware is a type two hypervisor. VMware runs here. And then our virtual machines are created, managed, and run through that type two hypervisor. Then we have the problem with this is that it's actually kind of slow because the number of layers you have to go through in order to get to the actual bare metal is a lot. It's a lot. So this type two hypervisor in this, this way here, this is actually quite slow. It works, but it's not very fast. And surely if you've ever run um, a Linux distro or Windows inside of a VM, a type two hypervisor, based VM, you'll note that the performance isn't so great. You can't exactly play like a 3D game inside of it. It doesn't really work that well. The second type of a hypervisor runs directly on the bare metal. It's called a type one hypervisor. It runs right on top of the hardware. So in a way, a type one hypervisor is a kind of operating system. And then all of the virtual machines will be created and run through the type one hypervisor. So how do you handle privilege between these two different hypervisors. Well, it's going to be different. It's going to be different for each of the hypervisors. So for type two hypervisors, they run in an unprivileged state because they are user programs. So that means that for a type two hypervisor, any instruction that it receives from one of its guest operating systems, it, if it's unprivileged, it can just be directly translated and executed as a normal user process within a type two hypervisor. But when you get a privileged instruction at a type two hypervisor, you are going to have to emulate that behavior and you emulate it by making system calls. So let's say that you want to write to a file. Well, the type two hypervisor is going to capture that privileged system call instruction and it's going to translate it into making the system call for the host operating system. So if you thought that chain of raising system calls before was bad, now it's even worse because now we have to tra capture it, translate it, reissue it really slow. And then things like disabling interrupts, the type two hypervisor is going to also have to simulate that behavior as well. And there are various ways that we can do it. We are not going to talk about that. I'll let you go uh, and read about some implementations of that on your own. Now, how does a type one hypervisor handle this pr concept of privilege? Well, here's the thing. The type one hypervisor is going to run in privileged mode because it's running on the bare metal. So it needs to run in a privileged state. The virtual machines themselves need to run in less privileged mode. We don't want them to be able to disable interrupts and execute privileged instructions directly. Just like the type two hypervisor, we're going to let unprivileged instructions just go right through the system. And in this case, we may not even need to translate them because they might be for the host arc anyways. So what we're going to do is just pass them right on. When we get a privileged instruction, however, we're going to have to let the hypervisor figure out what to do with it. So the hypervisor is going to catch the privileged instruction and handle the behavior appropriately. So it may pass some through and it may ignore others so, or emulate the behavior of others. Now, here's the thing. In order to make this work, You have to remember that the operating system, the host, is running in privileged mode uh, and a type one hypervisor is running in privileged mode. But the guest operating system is not running in a privileged mode. So the guest operating system has to believe that it's running in privileged mode. And the programs running on the guest operating system, they need to truly run in, unpri in unprivileged mode. So how does the hypervisor then differentiate between 
a user program on the guest operating system illegally making a privileged call and the guest operating system legally making a privileged call. So we end up running into this problem of how do we differentiate between the host OS making a, an allowed call and the guest OS's user program making a not allowed call. How do we differentiate between that in a hypervisor? Well, for the type one, we can actually do this quite easily. So we talked about earlier how there were rings of security, how we had privileged mode and unprivileged mode. That wasn't entirely true. We actually have four modes on most CPU, ranging from super privileged, like has all the privilege in the world, to like none. And there's two in between. And for a long time, we haven't really made use of the other ones in the middle. But now with virtual machines, we can make use of them. So what we do is we make use of these rings. The hypervisor runs in the highest privilege mode. The guest operating system runs in the next level. And then the user programs in the least. And that way, we can actually differentiate between the user program on the guest OS doing something bad and the guest OS not doing something it's allowed to do. And then the hypervisor can know whether it should emulate or pass through the privileged behavior or note that this was the user program trying to do something bad and raise the appropriate exception. So here's another issue that we have to solve. This isn't so much an issue, by the way, with a type two hypervisor, um, because type two hypervisors are just running as user programs. So we don't tend to, we don't get page table collisions here. But what we need to solve is how we're going to do virtual memory for type one hypervisors. We need to, we want each of our virtual machines to believe that they are the only operating system in existence. And there's various ways that we could do this. We could say, here's all my RAM and you get this chunk and you get this chunk and you get this chunk. And um, there, there, there's your memory. And the, the, what the hypervisor can do is just say, okay, so I am then going to map this range from zero to what for you and zero to what for you. But here's the thing. That is going to physically restrict the number of VMs that can run on that hardware. What if I wanted to support, just like I want to, I don't want to do that kind of allocation in an operating system for virtual memory, and I use paging and on-demand paging to try to allow a greater degree of multiprocessing, what if I actually want to support more guest operating systems or guest VMs on my type 1 hypervisor than I could actually physically divide up? Well. The problem that comes up is that if I do that, the page table of the guest operating systems, since they all believe they all have access to all the physical memory, what happens if one VM maps to one physical page and another VM maps to another physical page? That's a problem because we'd get a collision. Two VMs can't map to the same physical page, so which means that the type one hypervisor actually has to manage the memory better. So what's gonna have to happen is the type one hypervisor is actually going to have to implement paging and it's going to a shadow page table actually. So it is actually going to abstract physical memory into a shadow table. And then the guest operating system is going to think that the pages accessed via the shadow table are actual physical, even though they're not. So what we're doing is we're adding an additional translation level. But here's the problem. If we do it directly, that would, if we do this, where the, the hypervisor has every memory instruction, ha, we have to do a lookup for the shadow page table, it's going to be really slow. Because we already know this is slow. Right now, this is why we do MMUs. We have MMUs, so we don't have to involve a kernel of some kind for every address translation. And by adding this extra layer of look up, we are now involving the hypervisor in every single address translation. So that is why we needed hardware support for VMs. 
So we call it extended page tables and modern CPUs have support for this. So if you look at the Nehalem architecture, which is the i7s released in like 2008, I don't actually know when the release date, when the, I, the Nehalem architecture was, because I was working at Google with the chips before they were released. So my perception of when Nehalem was released and other, and the actual when it was released is two different dates. I think it was late 2007, maybe early 2008, Nehalem was finally released. Their MMUs actually have support for the shadow page table or the extended page table as it's known. So the idea then is that the type one hypervisor doesn't actually have to do the address translations for the shadow table, the MMU can do it itself. So we're going to be significantly improving the performance there. The only time the type one hypervisor has to get involved is when we have a world switch. Now, if you're wondering, what is a world switch? Well, it's like a context switch, except instead of context switching between two processes, we're context switching between two machines. So on a world switch, that is when the type one hypervisor will update the extended page table information in the MMU so that the MMU can continue to perform the correct address translations. So that's exciting. World swap, I guess it's also called. So yeah, that's exciting because now we're going from like a four level page table to like a five level one. Now, how do you handle devices? So this is an interesting thing. Um, for things like the file system, if you have a type two hypervisor, your file system is actually a file. <laughs> so you're creating a disk in the type two hypervisor. Well, that disk is just a file. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. And the, v, the uh, hypervisor will emulate the operations of actually like storing onto that file system. Um, the other way that you can do it is you can do things like add extra partitions. So each VM can have its own actual physical partition. You can run out of partitions or have silly numbers of partitions. Um, so there's, as I said, the best way to actually present a, a disk to a VM is actually to present it as, as a file. So whether that is the type one hypervisor presenting it as a file or the type two hypervisor presenting it as a file, that's the easiest way to create a disk. Here's a file and you can treat that in any way you want. So you can actually create a magnetic tape file system and just store it as a file. It's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. But what about actual like key presses? So there's different thing, ways that things we need to consider with actual interrupts. So the first thing is, do, do we want, we want to make sure that key presses are going to be isolated. So, or do we want isolation? So here's the idea. Let's suppose you have two VMs running on your disk. Somebody pushes a key. If VM one is running and VM two is sleeping, then the key press shouldn't wake VM2. So one of the things that you could do for um, handling interrupts is when the interrupt is received, send it to every VM and let each VM handle it. But that's, we may not necessarily want to do that. That can be a bad thing. Hence, we have to think about it. Do we want to isolate the interrupts from certain VMs? Um, so one of the things that we can do is interrupt redirection and pass through. So the idea is we can actually assign the device to a specific VM. And then if that specific device throws an interrupt, we know exactly which virtual machine in which to pass the interrupt forward to. So for example, if I am actually running uh, a type two hypervisor, which this is a little easier to talk about. Um, a type two hypervisor, obviously your guest, the guest operating system doesn't get the interrupt. The host gets the interrupt. And the host, when it receives the interrupt, will the type two hypervisor will be accepting things like that. It'll be waiting for things like that. And so the type, the, the host OS will pass that forward. Um, to the, to the type two hypervisor. It's not so much passed through as an interrupt, they would be passed through like waiting on a lock or something. 
So there's different ways of implementing. On a type one hypervisor, however, we would mark, okay, VM1 is running. So a key push will go to VM1 and we'll let VM1 handle that key press. In order to do this, of course, though, you need some hardware support, which is why, again, we don't haven't seen VMs being used pop and popular amongst consumers until about 15 years ago. All right, that was a really high level overview of how virtual machines work. And we're really only scratching the surface of how, what goes on. Because I just wanted to give you a taste of it. Just as something fun and exciting. So just to kind of close this off, I want to talk about why do we do virtual machines? So you already know we can use a virtual machine to, you know, create, run a different operating system on our computer. And we could do that because I'm running Windows and I need to do some Linux development, but I don't want to reboot and I don't have a second computer. So a VM lets us do that. We can use a VM to make our computer behave as another kind of hardware. For example, with OS 161, runs on a MIPS R3000. So there's a virtual machine where we can support the hardware. We do this kind of thing as well when we're doing development for Android and iOS, especially iOS. We have a virtual machine that we run for iOS development to test our programs. Yes, I've done iOS development. All right, but there's some other really good reasons why you might have a virtual machine. So for example, let's suppose that, um, so we've already talked about developing and testing for other architectures or operating systems. But what if you are implementing a program or let's say a driver or something that could have an impact on the host operating system and you don't want it to cause any harm? Then run it in a VM where it's safely isolated from the actual physical system. And on that note, let's suppose you download a program from the internet. Let's suppose that you can't afford to buy Flame from Autodesk. So you go on the internet and you find a copy of Flame. You download Flame. But you're sitting there and you're like, you know, this program, I'm not sure it's not got a virus in it. So what you do, you don't want the virus to affect your host operating system. So you create a VM. And you run Flame inside the VM where it is safely isolated from the host. So if there is a virus, it's not a big deal because it's isolated. And if you discover the virus, just toss the VM, you're done. So virtual machines give us an, a safe, cheap sandbox for both users and developers. And it's a really, really great tool. But another thing that we use virtual machines for, not as a user, but as like a corporation, is they use VMs for resource utilization. So I said I'd come back and talk about Amazon a bit more, um, but I'd actually like to tell you a bit about it. So many of you are probably familiar with Amazon AWS to some degree. And how it started is if you look at the usage during a holiday season, you would note that um, Amazon needs a lot of computing power during the holiday season. And then during the summer, they don't need as much computing power. So like, what are we gonna do with this computing power during the summer? So the, why don't we rent it out? And so that's kind of how AWS got started is Amazon realizing they've got all these extra resources they purchased to handle the holiday season were idle in the summer. So by using virtualization, you can rent out time on their servers, which gives them better utilization, makes them some extra money. And of course it took off so big that now they're making data centers to do this and so is everybody else. So VMs can also improve our resource utilization. And another cool thing you can do with VMs is checkpoints and snapshots. So let's say that you're in the middle of some work and you wanna be able to pause everything to reinstall an update in your host OS. You can pause the VM, restart your, your host computer. When you restart the guest com or host computer, you restart your guest VM and it continues from the position that you left off in. That's pretty neat. And you could put that checkpoint even in source control. So it's kind of fun. All right.
That is a very brief, like, 20-minute intro to virtual machines. And I'm going to end that there for today. In our next and final episode, we are going to take up that wonderful favorite problem of mine uh, with the counting the number of reads and writes. And then we're going to talk about operating system design. So we'll see you on Thursday. You're looking at a small portable computer called the IBM 5100. It's helping a lot of different people do their work more productively. Managing real estate investments entails many difficult decisions. Do I pay it now or later? What about the landscaping? Can we afford it? What about taxes? There are many, many difficult decisions to make. It's really nice having a computer to help. It weighs about 50 pounds. You can plug it in anywhere. Bad weather, late deliveries, construction delays of all kinds. How is it going to affect our schedule? Now we can find that out, fast. The 5100 can help handle some very complex information. Jet fuel is expensive. At Simmons Precision, we're developing a product that'll help the pilots save fuel. Flight test time is also expensive. But we do our flight tests right here in the lab on our 5100 and save time and money. Capacity? About the same as some large computers a few years ago. We're a mid-sized life insurance company. If we want to compete, and we do, we've got to be flexible. We've got to get answers fast. This little machine will help us do it. The 5100 is easy to learn and simple to use. There are countless combinations of feed we can mix. What is the most economical for any particular herd? That's what I'm figuring out now. The cost of the 5100 is reasonable. Paper, ink, size, waste, overhead, and don't forget the shipping cost. Estimating a printing job is not so easy. Our estimators handle 50% more work since we got the 5100. We do it faster and a lot more accurately, and our customers really love it. The IBM 5100. It's bringing the advantages of the computer to more and more people. IBM, helping put information to work for people.